Hello, everyone. I'm American College of Radiology Director of Public Affairs, Sean Farley. Welcome to the PAMA AUC Deadline is Firm. Prepare now for 2020 webinar. We'll have four presentations tonight, followed by a robust question and answer session. First, ACR Economics Commission Chair Dr. Ezekiel Silva will explain current clinical decision support requirements following the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule final rule. Next up, Dr. Carol A. Hulka, Chief of Radiology at Cambridge Health Alliance, will share how her health system has integrated CDS into their daily workflow. Dr. Kirsten Meisinger, a family medicine physician, national faculty for the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, and clinical instructor in ambulatory care and prevention at Harvard Medical School, will then describe how CDS has improved imaging care. And finally, Alexandra Hollenkamp, a patient advocate at Union Square Family Health Center, explains how evidence-based guidelines help patients have meaningful discussions with their providers. After those presentations, we'll be joined during the Q&A session by Bob Cook, Vice President of the National Decision Support Company, which offers the Care Select Imaging ACR Select CDS platform. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in the event. By default, you join the presentation using your computer speaker system to listen to the presenters. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will also have the opportunity to submit text questions to tonight's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane on the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentations. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. Also, tonight's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within a few days with a link to view the recording. Now with that, I would like to introduce ACR Economics Commission Chair, Dr. Ezekiel Silva. Sean, thank you. Yeah, this is Zeke Silva. As Sean mentioned, I, I'm Chairman of the ACR's Commission on Economics. I'm also a practicing diagnostic interventional radiologist. I'm in San Antonio, Texas with the South Texas Radiology Group. And I'd like to kind of set where we are from sort of a calendar perspective. So we're a few weeks from January 1st, 2019, and that's generally from a regulatory perspective when sort of the new rules affecting payment systems, such as the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, go into effect. Just as a reminder of how the general rulemaking process occurs, in July, around July 1st, the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule proposed rule is released. Over the summer and into the early fall, specialties, including the ACR, stakeholders, the public, comment on those rules. Recall that we did a webinar around the September timeframe, similar to this one, where we talked about those proposed rules. They were not finalized at that time. That final rule usually drops around November 1st of each year, and that rule has dropped. So much of the focus of my comments tonight are going to be on the updates which came out of the final rule. I want to make sure that we are all on the same page as far as what the requirements and expectations are for the program. But really the highlight of the presentation tonight is going to be the subsequent speakers who are really going to talk about their personal experiences within this program, but I get to kind of, kind of handle the early boring details, if you will. So let's go ahead and let's, uh, if we could go to the next slide. Just as a reminder, the, the program, the AUC program was part of what was, what was called PAMA of 2014, the Protecting Access for Medicare Act. The original statutory timeline is before you. Understand that what that means is by January 1st, 2017, this program was essentially supposed to have been sort of up and running live. Now, obviously we're late 2018, so that, sort of has been delayed, which has given us more time to prepare, more time for education, more time for the kinds of discussions tonight. But just as a reminder, the, the AUC criteria were, by November of 2015, the qualified clinical decision support mechanisms were to be released by April 1st, 2016. That actually occurred in June 2016, so that has occurred. The consultation requirement, obviously, we haven't reached that around um, the July 2017 timeframe, you know, additional qualified CDSMs were identified. And remember, the program actually requires that outliers be identified, which was originally intended for 2020. But again, we're going to talk about, and I'm going to show a slide similar to this one shortly that has the updated timeline. But let's, let's dig into the final rule now and, and go to the next slide, please. The next two slides are, are a little dense. What I'm going to do, if it's okay, is I'm going to go through each sort of bullet, and I'm going to read kind of what, what's on there, and then I may or may not make a few comments thereafter. So here's kind of the latest based on the November 2019 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule. There was an expansion to the applicable payment settings. So now in addition to the existing settings, which are the physician office, hospital outpatient, and ambulatory surgical centers, now also 
covered under this policy are independent diagnostic facilities or IDTFs. Okay, the ACR generally supported this concept, thinking that was a site where we thought appropriate ordering was reasonable. I just want to make a point after this bullet is there was some language in the rulemaking that talked about professionals being required for this program. That is actually true. It is a professional component requirement. So when we provide an interpretation or the PC as physicians billing that claim, we are responsible for this program. But it also applies to the facilities, the hospitals from outpatient care, the physician offices potentially billing the technical component out of the Medicare physician fee schedule, and as I, as I stated earlier, obviously the independent diagnostic testing facilities. The next bullet is consultation by ordering professionals. Recall that the proposed rule discussed allowing, quote, auxiliary personnel to provide the consultation from the ordering professional perspective. We commented and thought that was a little bit vague. There also recall there was language in the proposed rule about those services being incident to, which is actually terminology that really doesn't necessarily apply to clinical staff performing clinical activities, but really applies sort of more from a billing perspective. So CMS has come forward in the final rule, and they've updated the language. So now, rather than being something general like auxiliary personnel, now it's clinical staff under the direction of the ordering professional. Those clinical staff are expected to have clinical background sufficient to inter interface with the clinical decision support mechanism to understand the patient's clinical condition and circumstances, but importantly, to interact appropriately with the ordering professional, you know, the, the internal medicine or what are later the family practice physician that's actually engaged in ordering the exam. So it can't be someone that has a non-clinical role. For example, the, the, and I mean this respectfully, the receptionist can't do this program. That's just not under the qualifications as Medicare defines that. Claims-based reporting is the next bullet. I'm going to talk about that. So CMS has clarified that the reporting from a billing perspective will involve the following. It will involve HCPCS codes, which are essentially G codes, which are different than conventional CPT codes. We understand that those G codes are going to be CDSM, Clinical Decision Support Mechanism Specific. Recall I showed in the earlier slide, there are a number of clinical decision support mechanisms, including the ACR, that have already been identified and been accepted into the program. At some point, those CDSMs, so whatever CDSM the individuals on this call, your practice is using, that will be specific to the G-codes. The modifiers will indicate the nature of the AUC consultation. So, for example, it may be adhere, perhaps not adhere, perhaps not applicable, and that'll be a separate sort of lying on the line on the claim. Now I've had to predict the question on a call, especially from some of my billing RBMA folks, is okay, fine. So where what field are we populating? How is the claims process going to go forth? Here's where we are in this. So we expect, now that the final rule is passed, that CMS through its contractors will release coding guidelines. It'll probably be a transmittal or, you know, what's thought of as an MLN article. You know, the ACR is watching that very closely. We're not aware that that has been released yet. As soon as it is, and I predict the RBMA will do the same, and I predict the specialty societies outside of radiology will do the same, and that is we'll interpret that guidance and provide additional guidance to our members as soon as possible. Because, again, this program, and we're going to revisit the timeline, but it's going into effect, as we'll discuss, in 2020. So I don't want people to feel rushed as though you have to have this in place three weeks from now, but I do want to ponder that this is going to be going to effect within the short term. Um, with that said, let's go to the next slide, if we could, please. The top bullet, the implementation date. So now, in the final rule, CMS has confirmed that the program will be implicated, implemented on January 1st of 2020. So that's roughly 13 months from now. Starting on January 1st, 2020, the consultation will be required. The ordering professional will need to consult consult the AUC for the clinical sports, uh, decision support mechanism. The furnishing provider, i.e. most of us, will have to report that that AUC has been on the claim through the billing processes, which I just described. So this is pretty much CMS saying this is going to happen. Now, I will say that first year, January 1st, 2020, is an education and operations testing period. And what that means is essentially the payment's not at risk. So it, as, as we move forward with the program, when we submit claims, we have made an attempt to implement this program. As long as that attempt is made, even if it's erroneous, if we don't process the claim properly or an improper G code is used or some other claims shortcoming, that claim will still be paid. 
I'm going to show shortly that's going to change in 2021 when payment will be at risk. There was discussion on the next bullet, which is significant hardship exemptions. So they've clarified the ones that are before you, insufficient Internet access, EHR, vendor issues, or number three, extreme and uncontrollable circumstances. So these hardship exemptions are a self-attestation by the ordering professional. So if that ordering professional has one of these hardship exemptions and they are not able to satisfy the program, they will translate that information to the furnishing professional and that will be indicated in the claim that there's no ability to indicate the G codes and the modifiers I indicated previously because of the hardship exemption applies. The question that's come up is, is the furnishing provider professional responsible if that self-attestation is proved later to not be accurate? And the answer to that is no. CMS has been specific and said that the furnishing professional, if they in good faith have tried their best to confirm the hardship exemption, that from a compliance billing perspective, they wouldn't be responsible. The third sub-bullet, exemption separate from the promoting interoperability policy and macro. Recall that macro, or what's now generically referred to as the quality payment program or the merit-based incentive payment system, that there's a whole set of exemptions in there, for example, for promoting interoperability. Now, from a radiology perspective, you know, we have non-patient-facing status, and there's some, so, some more generic sort of exemptions, but there's also specific exemptions for promoting interoperability, which within the quality payment program actually involve an application process prospectively in the year as part of this program, as far as the AUC program, that doesn't apply. The exemptions are indicated on a claim-by-claim -claim basis with each individual claim under the premise that the program would be sort of a live or ongoing program, if you will. I will say the ACR supported this concept. I will say there were other comments regarding additional hardships, which I won't specify, which CMS did not finalize. The question remains regarding outliers, those that are not participating in the program from an ordering professional perspective, will be subject later to prior authorization. CMS has indicated that that will start in 2022, 2023, the identification of those individuals, presumably. The 2020 timeframe, when this is the testing ordering period, they have indicated that that period of time will not be used for identifying outliers, which is relatively significant for just our interactions with our referring positions as far as initiating the program. So let's go to the next slide, please. What I'd like to do is let me bring all of this together. It's a lot of information, so to keep in mind the earlier time frame, but let's talk about the updated timeline. So we're currently in between those first two green dots. We're in December of 2018. We're currently in the middle of actually a voluntary reporting period. So those that are in the community that are providing these services, that are engaged in AUC, at the claims level, there's a QQ modifier that would be applied. I've already mentioned January 2000 or January 1st, 2020 is when this educational and operations testing period begins. January 2021 is the start date. That's when payment is at risk. Reflecting back on the rulemaking comments that I made earlier, you know there will be a rulemaking process next year for 2020. There'll be another rulemaking process for 2021. So this guidance is going to evolve but we fully believe the program is going to continue to move forward as it has. And as I mentioned, 2023 and 2024 will be sort of when the outliers are identified. Uh, I've got two more slides. Let's go to the next slide if we could, please. You know, there's considerable discussion, and I briefly mentioned it about the quality payment program. I just want to remind people that there is you know, one of the four performance categories under the merit-based incentive payment system. You know, it's quality, cost, promoting interoperability, and then there's improvement activities. One of the improvement activities, and this doesn't apply to we as ordering professionals, but do, or furnishing professionals, but does apply to ordering professionals is a high-level MITS improvement activity credit for those that are engaged in that interface, that AUC, that clinical support at the point of ordering. And then let's go to my last slide if we could. And just I want to just reiterate this point, that this is not a prior authorization program. You know, there's, if, you, if you go to sort of non-radiology meetings and you talk to other medical professionals, you know, there's considerable angst in the medical community about prior authorization. And it's not just for advanced diagnostic imaging, but it's for molecular testing, laboratory studies, surgery, chemotherapy. And so this is a program that we've, from the beginning, intended to be point of care, that it's not FTEs in the background sitting on phones, and it's an interactive process. There's no hard stops that the physician, the ordering professional, decides that he or she doesn't agree with that recommendation. There's not a hard stop. They can continue forward. It's really intended to be an educational tool for physicians and payments, and I will add both of whom we're going to hear from shortly. So I want to thank everyone for their attention. I just as a reminder, there will be significant time at the end for questions. Bob Cook is on this call as well. 
And so I just, if you have some, some questions about the regulatory uh, content that I provided, there'll be plenty of time at the end to, to address those. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Sean, and thank you again. All right, Dr. Silva, thank you very much. Valuable information. Now I would like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Carol Holka. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm Carol Holka, uh, also a practicing radiologist, chief of radiology at Cambridge Health Alliance. Next slide, please. Just to give you a, the background of Cambridge Health Alliance, we have about 140,000 patients in the Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston Metro North region. We have three major facilities with two hospitals, Cambridge Hospital and Everett Hospital. There's a Somerville ca campus with an emergency department. We have an extensive ambulatory primary and specialty care network with offices and multi-specialty groups all over this area. So we're, we're across a wide geographic area under one hospital license. We are uh, under an employee model. We're salaried um, and, and are, we're basically a community hospital, but we do have academic affiliations with um, Harvard Medical School and Tufts. And I'll add that we have about um, 700 physicians and 500 allied health professionals, such as PAs, nurse practitioners, psychologists, pharmacologists, and social workers. Um, next slide, please. So back in 2016, when we thought that the 2017 deadline was um, going to happen, we decided we should start looking at different vendors um, for this program. And, and looked into you know, why we should do this. We are also, I should add, our, our um, hospital is, an, we are an accountable care organization, so any way to reduce costs uh, with, through imaging uh, seemed appropriate as well. Um, it's better care for the patient. You, it, it would be nice to get the right test first, and this seemed to fit that um, need. Uh, the program's helpful to enhance efficient decision making uh, for order entry. There's an education, as mentioned by Dr. Silva, the educational component um, is, is seemed attractive. And uh, so we uh, chose our vendor and decided to get started with the CDS program. Next slide, please. So how did we get started once we uh, chose a, a vendor? We uh, I basically called around at, to some area, larger area hospitals who already had some sort of program in place to, to understand what they had to go through to um, get this started. Um, and then we decided to put together a multidisciplinary team that met regularly with the vendor. This included radiologists, the chief of surgery, chief of emergency medicine, our chief medical informatics officer, who is also a family practice physician, and the um, IT team. And the IT team was um, incredibly helpful throughout this en entire process, as was the, the vendor. We made um, many joint decisions as a group meeting regularly this way. Uh, we looked at the user interface and how that would work with our electronic medical records. Um, most important, we decided what level of criteria will we use above which uh, the ordering provider won't be notified that this is inappropriate. So I have to say I was worried about adding clicks to our fellow physicians' lives, providers' lives, um, already fatigued with the electronic medical record. So we decided on a it's a scale of one to nine with uh, one to three being inappropriate or not, not recommended, four to six intermediate, and seven to nine uh, the right choice. Um, we chose a level of six for our group um, for, for now to get started. Uh, next slide. So preparing the providers for change. The first thing I did in the summer of 2000. Uh, 17 was meet with the chiefs, all the chiefs of service, and let them know what was coming um, and that it was a, a regulation. We really didn't have a choice, but I tried to educate them in the process. Then we began meeting, and I would meet, at, and IT came to every single meeting um, with other departments throughout the summer prior to our February and uh, fall, prior to our February 2018 implementation. 
and and did one-on-one -on -one meetings with departments, showing them exactly how the, what the program would look like when they're ordering a test. We also provided one-on-one -on -one help. We provided web-based demonstrations such as this, a webinar where the IT team would um, run through what it's going to look like. Um, you know, we emphasized that there's no hard stop, that there are links to the ACR white papers, the information uh, that they can look up and learn why these are the correct decisions. So all of these, I think, help the, the clinicians uh, feel more comfortable with the with the change. Next slide, please. And it was important throughout the process to listen to the feedback from the various providers so that we could make changes as we went along. And I think that's where having the stakeholders at involved from the beginning and surgery and emergency department and so forth um, was very important to have their input. Uh, next slide, please. So on the day of Go Live, this was a big day. Um, we communicated many times in advance of the Go Live day via the um, you know email or our electronic newsletter um, with multiple reminders for the providers. On the day of Go Live, we provided extra staffing in radiology. We had extra staffing in, at the IT help desk uh, by phone. Uh, through email to address any questions or difficulties that the providers might have that day. And it actually went pretty smoothly um, that day and the following week. Uh, next slide, please. So we have some initial re results um, for about six months, and this is a subset of the orders about, uh, and you can see um, this is the behavior, if, if it was changed or not, depending on the level. So uh, you can see about 8.4% changed their decision, 83.4% proceeded, and 8.2% did not sign the order, so abandoned ordering that test. Next slide, please. One can look at a subset of orders in terms of the uh, order appropriateness level, and about 45% were appropriate in that 7 to 9 uh, scale. Uh, not about 10% were in that intermediate appropriateness and 10% not appropriateness, and there was no score for a variety of reasons given to 35%. Next slide, please. And this just demonstrates another way. You can look at the data with with these uh, with these programs any way you want. Um, this just divides it by modality: nuclear medicine, MR, and CT. And you can see, you know, CT is the one of the bigger. Uh, larger volume services that we provide, and it affected about half of um, that volume, similarly with MRI. And these are our baseline uh, data. We'll find out how things go as time goes on. And in addition, you can look at the data by individual providers. You can look at it any way you want. So it's pretty helpful. You can give people feedback as you go along. That concludes my um, portion of this uh, talk, and I'll be happy to hand it back over to Sean. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hochul. Now it's time to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Kirsten Meisinger. Thanks, Sean. My name is Kirsten Meisinger, and I'm current medical staff president of Cambridge Health Alliance, uh, and I am also a practicing family physician at the Union Square Family Health Center. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's very important when uh, one is a busy primary care physician is feeling the support when you have a major change like Carol outlined. Um, so our rollout phase um, was essential. And one of the things we do quite well at Cambridge Health Alliance um, and aspire to do better is actually provide both provider and staff training at monthly site meetings. Um, and this can be a variety of topics. And in this case, one of the things we did is uh, alert the providers and the staff to this upcoming change. The system for receiving and acting on, on feedback um, from that meeting was actually uh, functioned quite well and providers felt quite reassured going into this. As always, as we know, once something is up and running is where you really start to see uh, where some of the best laid plans uh, can not so much go awry since we didn't have any uh, any major um, 
think uh, disasters or uh, or moments where providers felt unsupported, but there were uh, a few little tweaks that were required. And well, one example of this is uh, when I was trying to order a pulmonary nodule follow-up CT, which actually the very helpful EHR um, and PDS program had prompted me to remember to order on behalf of the patient. Um, I was unable to actually code that for pulmonary nodule follow-up. But my uh, reaching out to, to Carol Hulka, Dr. Hulka and her team um, was in, had the issue resolved within a month. And I have to say that it's a pretty spectacular uh, turnaround time um, given the magnitude of the changes that, that we had. Next slide. So in within the first few months, um, I did notice quite a few changes in my practice patterns um, and a lot more reflection on what I was able to do with the ordering. The uh, efficiencies lagged, of course, um, uh, it's it less in what it felt like my daily practice was, and I, we have probably better data um, at the level uh, of this, what the CDS program provides in terms of system-based efficiencies. But one of the, the things that I really enjoy um, is that the CDS has provided me with guidance about what the most appropriate tests are. And it's it, one of the challenges in primary care is that you have to stay up to date on an incredibly broad field uh, all of the fields really of medicine uh, within your purview as a primary uh, care physician or provider. And what, really what this has done is it's provided me instant feedback. And, and honestly, what I wind up doing is I wind up playing a, a little bit of a game with myself because I try and get in that seven, eight, nine range every time. And it'll give you instant feedback on how, on how you've done. Um, and so trying to keep things fun is also, I think, uh, a worthy, a worthy um, investment from this, uh, this webinar tool. So I thank, I thank Carol Holko for putting a little levity into my day. Uh, one of those time savers we noticed right away uh, was that actually we were able to stop calling our friendly neighborhood radiologists um, as part of our network and actually really use this tool um, in front of um, the patient at times. Uh, to be able to give them a real-time guidance on what was going to happen and not have to um, explain to them that we'd have to call them back. I was also able and remain able to override any suggestions when I would have multiple issues be addressed. So, for example, when I uh, needed to do follow-up or thought it was convenient to do follow-up for an ovarian cyst at the same, same time that I would need abdominal imaging for uh, a new onset of pain in a patient, I was able to to respectfully override the suggestions of the program um, because it was difficult to communicate these two simultaneous diagnoses. Next slide. So of course, nothing is, right, no benefit is, uh, is ever without its challenges. So this has been definitely a challenging to absorb all of this new information during, during patient visits. Um, and strive to continue to pay attention to the, the people that I'm, that I'm serving um, in the office. Um, we've been playing with some workflow changes to, to see if we are going to um, get it too involved and, um, and have to pay too much attention to this program. We may go back to um, informing the patients in, in various um, cases about what the particular study is that they're going to get. Uh, for their defined problem after they, uh, the patient actually leaves the office so that we can stay on time in a, in a busy clinical practice. Next slide, please. So this uh, webinar uh, is really one of the wonderful uh, products of a program called the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. Um, and so the ACR and the ABFM actually are two of the support and align work alignment network organizations um, as part of this CMS initiative. What we are striving to do, and I hope we are doing successfully this evening, is to disseminate best practices um, like this uh, program uh, and, uh, and other programs like, for example, the ABFM Prime Registry, which uh, I'm a big fan of, um, and the National Radiology Data Registry, which I know nothing about, but I uh, defer to Drs. Hulka and Silva. Uh, the goal of all of these things is to actually make us more efficient, keep us all up to date uh, on, on the most recent evidence so that we can continue providing the highest possible quality of care and help us evaluate our performance and then initiate improvement um, <clears throat> and initiatives within our organizations. One of the wonderful things about a program like CDS is that you actually have data to work with and that can inform 
your improvement efforts within your organization. So I I really encourage you to uh, adopt programs like this uh, and consider this in your daily practice. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Sean to introduce our our last speaker, uh, our patient advocate, Alexandra Hollenkamp. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Meisinger. And as Dr. Meisinger said, it's time to introduce our final presenter, our patient advocate, Alexandra Hollenkamp. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Alexandra Hollenkamp. I'm a patient, um, and I'm here to give you a little bit of a patient perspective tonight. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, one of my most recent experiences with radiology was the result of an ER examination. I had an ultrasound during an ER visit that identified an ovarian cyst. I was told that I would need to follow up with imaging six weeks later. The appointment was put in my calendar app and quickly forgotten. When it was time for my ultrasound, I had no idea why I had the appointment. No provider had explained why the second ultrasound was necessary. I didn't even know what knowledge we hoped to gain from the ultrasound. I was a little lost, a bit frustrated, and pretty confused. My overall concern as the patient was having imaging done that that is not likely to lead to actual results or improvement. Advance the slide, please. Um, taking from my past experience, my advice for imaging discussions would have to be make your patients an active partner in their own care. When patients understand why an image, an imaging exam is being ordered and have some understanding of why the exam should be done, we as patients feel empowered to ask questions and gain knowledge. With knowledge gained, stress levels are reduced. We acquire a certain confidence when providers engage us in conversations about our health. However, sometimes we feel a little rudderless, unsure of what questions to ask, wanting to ask the right ones and just not knowing what they are. At that point, many of us simply ask a benign question when we think we're supposed to ask. I know I'm very guilty of having my mind go blank when I'm worried or overwhelmed by a situation. More often than not, fear does set in and we reply with, no, I don't have any questions. Trust me when I say, as patients, we always have questions. However, we don't always have the ability to ask them. In addition to asking patients to be an active partner in their care, it is important to give patient advance guidance on what to expect during the exam and clearly explain what the patient will experience. When I had my follow-up ultrasound, I was given very little instruction on what would be happening during this exam. Only basic instructions like get changed, put this gown on, and lie down were given. I guarantee I would have been much more comfortable knowing going into the exam what happened during the exam. I understand that exams can become routine things for those administering them, and I think sometimes it gets forgotten that patients don't do this on a regular basis. By preparing the patient ahead of time for the exam, it also allows time for thoughts to develop and questions to be formed, asked and answered. It is also another way to include the patient, prepare them and alleviate any concerns surrounding the exam. Finally, making sure the patient has clear expectations and, are, and even clearer uh, expectations of communication surrounding the results. Patients want to know how and who will deliver the results of the exam. There have been a couple of times where I've had tests done and no results communicated with me. It leaves me wondering, was something found or was nothing found? No one wants to be left hanging after a test. Working with the patients and making them an active member of their care team is a huge game changer, not only for the patient, but for the provider as well. Advance, please. Something to beware, it is important for clinicians to balance paying attention to the patient and getting things accomplished during the visits. Awkward silences are, well, awkward. An easy way to remove the awkwardness is to explain to your patient 
why you're in front of your computer. Once again, by including them in their care, an awkward situation can become a comfortable silence. An easy way to avoid these awkward silences is to keep checking in with the patient. Give short updates about what you're doing. It doesn't have to be detailed, it just keeps the patient present with you in the room. Having this clinical decision support is a wonderful thing. It can allow the clinician to engage the patient and have questions answered quickly. It is an aid that will facilitate patient-clinician conversations to progress in a more fluid way. When clinicians have the guidelines readily available to discuss with patients, it is a valuable tool in making the best decisions. In my opinion, these decisions are made together in confidence with clinician and patient. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Hollenkamp and Dr. Silva, Holka, and Meisiger. Now, before we move on to the Q&A session, I would point out that you can find helpful resources to help you, your practice, and referring physicians get ready for the coming mandate at acr.org slash cds. Also, please visit the RScan website, including updates about the new Clinical Decision Support RScan Registry, as well as the ACR Practice Management Quality Informatics Toolkit. Uh, one more thing before we move on to the Q&A session. We'd like to, uh, to ask you to please answer the following two questions of tonight's poll. Uh, you'll have 15 seconds to complete each of them. Uh, the first one being uh, <laughs> the, right there on your screen, which option best describes your profession? And you can see the choices below. All right, we'll move on to the next one now, which is, which professional organization do you belong to? This is just to give us a quick idea of uh, who we have attending tonight's webinar, and this will help us uh, put together content for future webinars based on who we think is, uh, is on the line here with us. All right, we'll move on now. With that, Bob Cook, Vice President of the National Decision Support Company, will join us to begin tonight's Q&A session. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions panel in your attendee control panel. Um, now, we'll pick one here and we'll get started. And uh, this one is from Mark Rothenberg. This is for Dr. Silva. What are the risks and or penalties for not implementing CDS come January of 2020? Yeah, Mark, that's a great question. So you know, it's a testing period, it's a reporting and testing period, so technically payment's not at risk. So if we put forward an erroneous claim or, again, the claims process somehow has some shortcomings, it's, it's still paid. So I guess the risk is, obviously, if we do nothing, then the payment, then payment would be denied. It has to be some effort made on the claims process. But I think, Mark, maybe the greater risk is, you know, if I had to predict, I think CMS is sort of trying to push us along. I mean, 2021 is when the program truly goes live. And, and, and when I say that, I mean goes live in the sense that payment truly is at risk. If the claims process has shortcomings, the, the claim just doesn't get paid. So I think that's probably the risk is, is, is the need to start doing something, at least trying by 2020. And maybe I'll turn it over, and Bob Cook's with us now as well, and, and see if Bob has any additional thoughts on that question. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the only risks uh, of not getting started in 2020 are, you know, not being ready in 2021. Uh, it's still not 100% clear as to what data needs to be incorporated on the claims in terms of how uh, during the educational and testing period. Uh, although, as you discussed, Zeke, that, you know, no claim is going to be denied for incorrectly formed information. Um, it does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, at least at this point, until we get the information from CMS, that there will, you know, claims do not require anything. You know, there could be some possibility that claims may require some attestation of a consultation during that educational and testing period so that the organ markets are ready uh, come 2021. But we only know that once we get the uh, information from CMS early next year. All right. Thank you, both of you. Now, this is uh, another one for Bob Cook. Uh, it's from Tracy Fox who asks, how exactly will the CDS consultation be communicated from the ordering provider to the furnishing provider for claims reporting purposes? 
Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, this legislation is obviously not uh, uh, designed to uh, retrofit the way orders uh, are transmitted to furnishing providers, uh, and that the method of transmittal of ordering uh, orders to furnishing providers remains the same vehicles that are in use in today, which means either an electronic message or a, uh, a faxed order or, you know, within the four walls of a healthcare institution, you know, automated uh, functions within the EHR. So I'm going to break down each of those, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the method of transmittal. So as it relates to uh, EHR delivered decision support, where the exam is ordered within the EHR and furnished within the same healthcare system, the generation and transmittal of information associated with the consultation to the claims and revenue cycle process is generally handled automatically. In fact, we have many organizations who have integrated decision support into their electronic medical record application are already submitting uh, the QQ modifier, which is a optional uh, um, a modifier to the CPT code uh, to indicate that a consultation has taken place of a mechanism. Now, if you happen to be in uh, the ambulatory environment uh, and you uh, have access to an EHR with an integrated system, uh, there is actually a, C a HL7 standard that has been developed to convey this information in electronic orders so that if you're a furnishing site, you need to be uh, ensure that your systems that you use uh, to uh, furnish exams are capable to extract this information and put it into the right place inside of your information system to uh, reflect on the claim. Uh, and, and additionally, if th there are um, uh, there are free tools that are also made available where I know that, for example, the National Decision Support free tool produces information uh, and that CMS has instructed the mechanism producers that offer uh, uh, web access points to also include this information whereby after a consultation, a printable form is produced that contains the necessary CPT code modifiers and G codes uh, that can be printed or faxed uh, along with the order to the furnishing site such that it is uh, available to them. So there are a number of ways that this information can get out the door. Uh, if uh, you're a primary care provider in an ambulatory setting that does not have access to an integrated EHR system uses the web tool, the final step of their decision support interaction will be a printable or emailable form that contains the necessary data elements for a, a payable claim. All right, uh, this one can be for either Dr. Meisinger or Holka. Um, and uh, this one is from M Michelle Duet. I hope I'm pronouncing that, that last name right. But they, uh, they ask, any suggestions on the best way to uh, build interest at the hospitals that they serve to get involved? Um, they, uh, they say that nobody seems to have a sense of urgency where they practice to get ready before it's necessary. Any ideas? Uh, I guess I can try to answer that. This is Carol um, Holka. Uh, basically, it was driven by, we drove it, the radiology department drove it. Um, myself and the senior director, we were worried about the deadline back, you know, when it was an earlier deadline. And and it's 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 actually just not an option. And I think that, you know, discussing it and getting, um, you know, other providers uh, engaged, it, it, it's a challenge, but uh, this is going, to, I guess, expressing that this will affect their lives. So we need their participation. We need their input on how the interface is going to work best for them. And, you know, some of these um, products have um, even specialty specific programs where you can kind of tailor it to the specialty. They'd want to be involved in that in terms of the choices of exams that they can. Um, order so I, I think that I think that uh, educating your colleagues that this is inevitable it has to be done and we need your help to decide to make this you know as as um, smooth a transition as possible um, otherwise you know it's just radiology making decisions for them and I don't think anybody really wants that so I think it's just an education process and it takes time um, so, um, I hope that answers your question and good luck with it. All right. Hey, thank can, you very much. Is, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sean, this is Dr. Meisinger. So it's fine. I just think from, from the primary care perspective, the 
to give a slightly different angle on the question. One of the things that I really used to hate was being interrupted in my regular patient care by a call from my radiology colleague who needed either clarification about something I had ordered or had a suggestion for a separate test that they really felt was was a more appropriate that I you know had been unable to um, either communicate why I had ordered the test I had ordered sufficiently to them or really they were educating me about a better test for my for our patient and that has completely stopped and it wasn't often, but I don't order very many radiology tests anyway, quite frankly. So, but that has definitely in 2018, I've had a much happier um, year not being interrupted for that reason. And that's one of, I think, the, the really excellent clinical care um, motivations for people should be, you're going to become a better uh, primary care ordering physician. You're, you're probably going to uh, by the radiology side, have more insight into what it is people are thinking, and then you can pass that on to patients um, and really help them understand what they're um, about to experience, as Alexandra said so eloquently. So, so there's more than just financial motivators for this. Um, there's, you know, there's really good citizenship uh, between providers um, of different uh, specialties, and then there's also um, the good stewardship that we need to to really um, always be careful to maximize uh, in our practice lives for our, our patients. Great. Thank you very much. Now, next uh, question up is from Franklin Tesler. Um, and this could be either for Dr. Silva or for Bob, whichever one you want us to jump in here. But it is, how should emergency medicine providers document exceptions to applying decision support? Is the definition of conditions that qualify for exemption the same as in EMTALA? Yeah, Sean, thank you. This is Zeke. Let me take a first stab at it from a sort of a regulatory perspective, and then I'll let Bob kind of share his practical experience. So, yeah, the, the question is well-founded, because the question is, if emergency conditions are exempt from the program, you know, what, one, what are those conditions? Just as a sort of an overlying point, you know, that exemption is condition-based. It's not site-of-service or place-of-service-based. So the ER itself is not collectively exempt from the program. Now, if there are instances where the emergency physician feels that it is a true emergency condition, uh, trauma might be an example, acute abdominal pain, sepsis, things of that sort, then that clinical determination would presumably be documented in the records, and then that exemption would just need to be communicated to the subsequent furnishing provider. And that's fairly well defined in the regulations. They certainly do mention... Imtala as being sort of a guideline, but the, the, the criteria may be different. But I'd be interested in Bob's thoughts. Bob, what do you think? Uh, yeah, emergency medical condition is a defined term. I believe it's in uh, defined in the Imtala Act. And as uh, you mentioned, the exclusion applies to patients that have the emergency medical condition regardless of care setting. Uh, with respect to documenting that exclusion, obviously, uh, it depends on the method in which the order is being placed. If you have an uh, emergency medical condition situation within the electronic medical record, you know, I imagine that most healthcare organizations have workflows in place to allow treatment of that place patient before any of the electronic medical record interactions do occur. That being said, in many of the cases where we've implemented decision support within the electronic medical record, uh, we do utilize the emergency services index that many EHRs provide where they have a high acuity ESI as an example. In that case, we do not fire decision support and automatically apply the exclusion. Great. Thank you very much, Bob and uh, Dr. Silva. Uh, another question coming in, this one from Sandra Hensel. Uh, how do you handle outside orders that don't use CDS to choose the order, but the person entering the order gets the information when they do enter the order? Do you call the ordering person and tell them the finding? Bob, why don't you take that one, Bob? Sure. Um, so the uh, statute is uh, and the law is very clear that ordering providers cannot access decision support 
on behalf of the ordering providers for the purposes of payment. So consequently, if a scheduler, as an example, receives an order for a Medicare patient for an advanced imaging order, uh, advanced imaging service to be furnished, and there's no consultation information associated with that, my recommendation would be for that scheduler uh, to reach out and make that ordering provider aware of the uh, uh, access to either the free tool or the decision support tools within their uh, uh, um, you know, application, depending on, you know, again, their environment. Uh, and then at that point in time, you know, there could even be a, you know, sort of interactive educational session teaching, you know, the, the first time or the second time they access, uh, you know, they need to access decision support, you know, you could do that accessing together. And that would be kind of an educational consultation versus a consultation for the purposes solely of payment. But the law is very clear that the ordering provider cannot consult decision support on behalf of the, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the furnishing provider cannot uh, consult decision support on behalf of the ordering provider for the purposes of payment. So as such, an outreach, education, and otherwise uh, would be uh, the most appropriate uh, uh, course of action. And obviously, there are a number of tools that uh, the ACR provides uh, in terms of education and outreach in advance of the uh, 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 law coming online that hopefully will provide uh, these uh, organizations an opportunity to become familiar with decision support before the requirements are uh, active. Great. Thank you very much. The questions keep coming in here, uh, and we'll, we'll keep uh, turning them out here. Um, and this one is from Kathleen Rooney. How should we generate an appropriateness score when using outside orders? If the outside provider does not generate a score, does that affect our hospital's compliance? Uh, Dr. Silva or uh, Bob Cook, uh, yeah, feel free to, yeah. Yeah, that's a Bob Cook level question, but why don't you address that as well? If you could reread the question, please. Uh, that was yes. a dense question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how should we in terms of information? <laughs> got it, got it. It wouldn't be the first time I've been called that. Anyway, how should we generate an appropriateness score when using outside orders? If if the outside provider does not generate a score, does that affect our hospital's compliance? Uh, the outside provider uh, has the obligation to either consult decision support or report an exclusion. Uh, if the furnishing provider receives an order for a Medicare advanced imaging study that does not contain this consultation information, uh, the service that they furnish will not be payable. So the only way to make that a payable claim would be to have consultation data. And the only people that can generate that consultation data are the ordering providers or their clinical staff operating under their supervision. Great. Um, and this one is probably for Bob Cook again. You're getting a workout tonight. Um, it says, can we kind of go through a rundown of what an implementation of CDS uh, might look like at a 100% outpatient radiology group? And a 100% outpatient radiology group where, uh, you know, obviously the first uh, implement first aspect of implementation would be educational and outreach to those referrers that refer into uh, your, your organization, uh, those exams uh, that require, uh, uh, you know, decision support. And so there's outreach that needs to occur and, you know, a good opportunity to engage those referral referring providers, make them aware of the free tool, introduce them to organizations that offer tools for consultation. Uh, and then on the flip side, on the furnishing side, the uh, most important thing uh, that your organization will need to do is to ensure that you are working with your practice management system uh, and, and the vendor of that system to ensure that it is capable to receive the HL7 uh, uh, information from those sites that might choose to embed that information in an electronic order or uh, is capable to actually record the consultation data, which would be the modifiers and the G codes uh, as specified in the CMS transmittal and ensure that that data gets through the revenue cycle uh, to your billing company. And so uh, the implementation would be between the practice management system receiving the data and the workflows associated with scheduling along with the uh, uh, dialogue with the billing company to ensure that they're aware of the requirement and that the data they need to generate a claim uh, for your payment is generated. 
So that is, you know, at a uh, within the microcosm of a, a webinar, uh, a quick sketch as to what an ambulatory uh, furnishing provider organization might need to do to engage with the program. Great. Thank you, Bob. We'll give you a second to catch your breath there. This question is coming in phrased a few different ways. So this one will be for Dr. Silva. Uh, do the CDS or AUC requirements apply just to Medicare, or would it also apply to Medicare Advantage plans? Oh, it's a great question. Well, it's across multiple payment systems. Just to take a, even a bigger step back than that specific question was it definitely applies to the Medicare physician fee schedule. It definitely applies to the hospital outpatient prospective payment system, which is the HOP schedule. That's how hospitals are paid for outpatient services. And then, as I mentioned, ASCs as well as IDTS. Now, Medicare Advantage programs, those are administered by generally non-governmental agencies, more you know, traditional private payers, if you will. And I'm going to defer to Bob. But my, my, my thought is that that's not the case, Bob, as far as what their specific requirements are. But I, but I appreciate your input on this question because it's an important one. Yeah, the requirement is just for straight Medicare. So, for example, for uh, critical access hospitals who might bill under the optional payment method, once again, the program does not apply uh, and actually critical access hospitals, just as a good example, are not counted as applicable settings. So exams furnished within the critical access environment would not be subject to the consultation requirement. Now, that being said, you know, the best way to understand if a consultation is requirement is to work back from the payment method elected. So if it's straight up Medicare Part B advanced uh, imaging, uh, and it's paid under that payment model, whether it's a professional or a technical service, the consultation uh, is required. But programs like Medicare Advantage or other risk-based payment programs do not have the consultation requirement. Straight up okay, Medicare uh, Part B. All right, we're going to try to get through these remaining questions here uh, fairly quickly if we can. Also, this one comes in, and this is either for Bob or Dr. Silva. Uh, can the radiologist change the order, for instance, after the, the order has come through the CDS, can they change it, you know, for instance, no contrast or with contrast? How does that affect the process? Yeah, this is, Dr. Yeah, it's a really important question because you think about the prior authorization process, we're in a circumstance where when we change the order, oftentimes that sort of changes the pre-approval, if you will. Um, Bob, you've got a lot of experience with this. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll defer the specific answer to you, but it's a really important yep. question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so within Medicare payment models, there's a limited a number of things that a furnishing provider can do to modify the order until a new order is required. So as such, things like consult, uh, I'm sorry, things like contrast and laterality or things, uh, things of that nature, um, you know, are within the scope of the uh, furnishing provider to change, but other things like, you know, the actual service and protocol and things like that are not. And so there are some specific rules that govern the uh, number of changes that, I'm sorry, the, the, the scope of a change a furnishing provider might make uh, to a Medicare Part B order. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, and then uh, the second thing is that regardless of whether or not you change the order, which obviously this program gives you a good opportunity and pretext to ensure that the right order gets placed, uh, but that being said, uh, whatever the consultation information reported to you by that ordering provider is what's to be put on the, point, on the claim, independent of whether or not your revision would make the order more appropriate or otherwise. Great. Next question up is from Joni Hart, who asks, how do you handle providers that continually place orders with low scores? Yeah, this is Zeke Silva. I mean, that's an important question, and, and that's kind of the nature of the outlier program is if you have a provider that, for whatever reason, continue to order studies that are inappropriate on the AUC scale, the program's intent is to identify those physicians and subsequently subject them as quote-unquote outliers to prior authorization, which again, we thought would be by 2020. Now it's probably not going to be till 2023, 2024, but that, that's kind of the stick to the program. But I think it is worth re restating that it's not a, there's no hard stop. So that physician, even though they're ordering an inappropriate exam, there's not a hard stop that precludes them from ordering. Now, I think the question has come up several times on this call very appropriately is that when the order finally reaches the radiologist office or facility and he or she decides, whoa, this just really is not appropriate, I mean, that's when the, um, you know, subsequent conversations could, could, could occur from sort of a truly consultative sense. I don't know, Bob, does that answer the question? Anything else you want to add? 
well, what would you do before this program existed, number one? And number two, part of the reason this program exists is because the Medicare population of advanced imaging orders is unmanned and that there is uh, a need to control the cost within that population. And so as a result, this program you know, emerged as an alternative to the prior authorization program with the intent that evidence-based medicine will influence ordering be providers' behaviors. So as such, this gives you, I think, an a enhanced opportunity to have those dialogues with the ordering provider population and ensure that they are doing the right thing. And now that you have appropriate use criteria that's transparent and in their face uh, as to what the right thing is, it makes those conversations easier, in my opinion. Great. And um, here's a, an opportunity, I think, that uh, to talk about uh, our scan. Um, this one is from uh, Sean Komen, or Kalman, sorry. How do you get independent providers to utilize decision support? Um, Dr. Silla or Dr. Meisinger or Holko, do you want to jump in here on this one? I'd have to defer to Dr. Silva. We, um, not sure we've been, we're a, a network of all employed uh, physicians, so I haven't really encountered Dr. Silva, do you have experience? Yeah, with no, that? it's a it, no, it's a good question. I mean, the R scan has a, a, sort of a few sort of really true benefits to it. Number one is it has a platform for education because I, I think as was expressed and I think Dr. Holka expressed it well was just the importance of, of education for the non radiologists for the referring physicians and so it has educational materials that sort of very easily promote those types of conversations and then it has a specific condition. You know, pulmonary embolus might be an example where you can, rather than trying to tackle the entire universe of diagnoses and studies, et cetera, you kind of sort of focal, have a, a focus on a particular condition, and, and you can see improvement together collectively on those conditions. And then that kind of nicely, once you've established that base, you know, it's a nice transition to what's coming in 2020, which is when you start to have to use the billing processes, and then 2021 when payment's at risk. Um, Bob, you've had some experience with RSCAN. Is that congruent with what you've, what you've seen in the community? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole R-Scan program has been great in terms of, uh, you know, a, a tool for radiology to engage the uh, their referral population, uh, both the numbers and the data that has pr produced has been revelatory in terms of, you know, how an intervention can actually improve uh, 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 the appropriateness uh, of, of imaging procedures. Uh, and I think in general, um, what we've seen is that you know, although specialists may already know what they need to order primary care, given the uh, 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 diversity and increasing number of advanced imaging exams and procedures to and, and conditions that in which they can diagnose, really appreciate access to that kind of educational material. So we've seen great. some great results and interest in that. Okay, now here's another question that's been recurring here just in different ways. Uh, this one from William Guyette and from Judy Fisher. I, uh, regarding critical access hospitals, is the radiologist billing the professional component for an exam done at a CAH site excluded from the requirement even though billing under the uh, Medicare fee schedule? Yeah, this is something actually, I, I'm just gonna jump in here. This is something I think we need to discuss uh, a little bit at the ACR level. But certainly, the critical access hospitals is not an applicable setting. So any exams furnished within the critical access hospital environment would not be subject to the consultation requirement. However, if you're a radiologist that is providing services to that critical access hospital for a furnished exam that is billed under Medicare Part B, a consultation requirement does exist. Yeah, and this is Zeke. I'll, I'll just build on that. You know, the, the critical access hospital, you know, they're sort of the method one and method two billing, and, and I don't purport to be an expert on it, but I do agree with Bob. I think this is a question that we're sort of hearing recurrently is, and I think it's something that we sort of heard on the September webinar. We didn't have time at that point to reach out to CMS in time for the final rule to get some clarification. So I think it's a question that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll be able to answer either with direct communications with CMS or through rulemaking probably next summer and provide some guidance. But I really do appreciate the question, and it's definitely on our radar. Right now, you just got to build back from the claim. And if you're billing under Part B and your claim goes under Part B, then a consultation requirement exists. Good point. Okay, and this next question is from Donald Unrau, Jr. Um, 
what might be the definition around the ordering provider designates another professional in their practice to place an order and interact with the CDS tool? I guess they're asking who can do that uh, from the referring physician side. Yeah, this this is the Excel. But, you know, it's an important question. You know, we talked earlier and we talked about how the proposed rule talked about auxiliary personnel, and we kind of agreed that that was probably too generic of a term. That really the intent of the program was really that the ordering professional have some ability for an educational component, as was described earlier on the webinar. But the point that was made over the summer through the rulemaking process was that it needed to be more specific than auxiliary and that a clinical staff needed to be a person with sufficient training, with sufficient experience to not just interface appropriately with the CDSM but understand the patient's conditions, but importantly, interface back with the ordering professional, particularly when it's in a non-adherent study, when it's a study that the AUC is saying this is not the proper study, to have that type of information. And you have to understand, from a Medicare sort of policy or billing perspective, these kinds of clinical staff discussions come up pretty regularly. Think about you know, transitional care management codes or chronic care management codes, where you have clinical staff that are engaged in activities which are complementary to the overall medical face-to-face -face experience, but might not necessarily be in that same category. So, for example, you know, phone, calling a phone call to a patient or interacting regarding their prescriptions and things of that sort. So, to the, to the point of the question, it's an excellent question. I think it's another one that very much needs to be on CMS's and the ACR's radar because it'll be incumbent on us to provide that guidance. And I, I think it's pretty likely, it's definitely nurse practitioners, it's pretty likely RNs, it's pretty likely LVNs. And, but then you start getting into, and I, I mean this respectfully, sort of you know, medical assistants and, and, and non-credentialed training staff, you know, how much clinical staff interaction can they have? And it's an important question to clarify. Bob, do you have any other thoughts or experience? I have nothing to add. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. All right. We're going to do a couple more questions here before we wrap up. Um, a mechanical question, I guess, here. How do outpatient radiology groups gather the information from the AUC system to pass along to the billing folks? And that's from Jason Perry. Why don't you take that, Bob? How, so, I'll repeat it. I'm sorry. I'll repeat it. Uh, yeah. Okay. How do outpatient radiology groups gather the information from the AUC system to pass that along to the billing department? Right. So that information comes in, on their order. Uh, it will come in the form of a printable certificate that the uh, uh, mechanism that the ordering provider consults uh, generates, or it will come in an HL7 uh, message, uh, or it could potentially come through other means if the um, uh, radiology department is part of a system that uses, uh, you know, an EHR within their uh, environment. Uh, and 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 that's essentially how that information is gathered. Uh, and so, you know, it, the expectation is is that the ordering provider will provide that information along with the order uh, uh, to that ordering provider site. Uh, each consultation of the mechanism also generates a unique identifier, uh, and that unique identifier within the mechanism uniquely ties and can be used to reverse lookup. Uh, that consultation information as well. So another means to convey this information across the care settings beyond the order or facts is um, uh, through this number, which again, still needs to be conveyed on either an order or a fax, but that's the only way that that information can get there. Uh, again, the, 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 the TAMA program is not a program that is designed to change the way orders uh, are, are transmitted between ordering and furnishing sites. This is simply uh, defines information that needs to be conveyed along with the order data that would already be sent. And so um, that's the best I got here. Okay, we'll do one last question here before we wrap up. And uh, this one comes from Fred uh, Bernaccia, um, who asks, who provides the AUC software to the ordering physician? I guess, how does the, the referring physician get the AUC software to make all this possible? Yeah, so this is Zeke. I'll just start with the statutory perspective on that. Is there, the CMS was concerned regarding that very question, is the expense that would be incurred by referring physicians or ordering professionals. So the statute actually requires that there has to be a free platform available to those those physicians. And with that kind of statutory introduction, I'll, uh, from a practical level, turn over to Bob to maybe describe how that's managed in the community. 
Yeah, I mean, so there are a number of, uh, there are obviously a number of uh, mechanisms that uh, CMS has uh, approved or qualified for use under the program. Uh, each has a different range of AUC options available. Uh, I'm proud to say that we, we at National Decision Support Company, due to our uh, partnership with the American College of Radiology, have what we believe to be the most robust and complete set of appropriate use criteria available. And that being said, we make that available within a free tool that uh, organizations can use to comply with the program. The free tool provides for consultation and generation of that certificate of all available AUC, uh, and similarly provides access for a furnishing provider to uh, review uh, uh, consultation data or to perform consultations for whatever purpose that may be necessary. Uh, and that similarly, that tool is the tool by which you can also use to reverse look up that unique identifier. Uh, the, I believe in the uh, chat window here, Becky Haynes has put a link to the free tool landing page uh, that we publish and that uh, uh, individuals uh, can uh, register for access to that tool. And then that tool will provide an interactive tool at no fee uh, for compliance with the program. We also integrate the criteria, obviously, into electronic medical record applications. Uh, um, and, and, and that's obviously a different, different license. Great, fantastic stuff. Now, thank you, Mrs. Hollenkamp, or Ms. Hollenkamp, Mr. Cook, and Dr. Silva, Holka, and Meisinger. And I want to thank all of the attendees for attending tonight's webinar as well. You will all receive a follow-up email within a few days with a link to view a recording of tonight's webinar. We're getting several emails about that, but yes, there is a recording, and you will receive an email here in the next 48 hours or so uh, letting you know how to connect to that. Uh, the recording will also be posted on the ACR website, acr.org. Again, thank you all for joining us, and have a great night.